Yanis Varoufakis, bonjour. Bonjour. Nous vous recevons aujourd'hui pour une chaîne YouTube qui s'appelle Thinkerview, une chaîne internet, une chaîne indépendante. On vous reçoit dans le cadre de vos connaissances euh, en finance. And uh, I'm going to speak in French and in English for the translation. And uh, my community going to translate uh, after. It. And uh, we've got a translator for the tough question. So how are you today? Very well. I've slept well in Paris. And I'm very pleased to report that the weather is better than it was in Athens when I left yesterday. Are you afraid of what's happening in Europe right now? Terrified. Why? We are experiencing a postmodern 1930s. Our generation had its 1929 moment in the year 2008. And I'm afraid that um, history is repeating itself in a farcical way, but also quite faithfully. The monetary system, especially in Europe, which was designed like the 1920s gold standard, started deconstructing. The authorities continued business as usual. The more their policies failed, the more authoritarian they became in imposing them, shifting the losses from the banking sector that created the losses and the crisis onto the shoulders of the weakest citizens, beginning in Greece, Ireland, Portugal, eventually France and Germany. And the result of this deflationary crisis that was created, just like in the 19, early 1930s, was the rise of political monsters. Salvini is a carbon copy of Mussolini, carbon copy of Mussolini. The same narrative, the same promises, I'll make you proud again to be Italian, the same Uh, demonization of the Roma, of the foreigners, of the brown people, of Europe, of the establishment, in the interests of grabbing power to make the establishment stronger. We're experiencing this, the same thing again. The, the reason why some of us created the Democracy in Europe movement back in 2016, the reason why I got into politics from university life was precisely because some of us could see that this is exactly what was going to happen after 2008. So how, yes, terrified. How can you explain that the f how our politicians don't take countermeasure to to uh, to kick out the, the fascism or to kick out uh, uh, extremism because they cannot because they've got the, the financial system to behind them. They, they well, it's my opinion that um, they didn't see it coming. In the same way that politicians. Take Sarkozy and his lot, Lagarde and so on. Uh, they could not see the bankruptcy of Societe Generale. They could not see the bankruptcy of BNP Paribas. Uh, Merkel could not see the bankruptcy of Deutsche Bank. They could not see it coming. Um, in America, Hank Paulson, the former Goldman Sachs chairman, um, President George W. Bush at the time in 2007, they could not see, they could not believe that this wonderful uh, edifice you know, of Lehman Brothers, of financialization, uh, what Ben Bernanke himself, the former chairman of the Fed, had called the great moderation. They could not see that it was not moderate. It was a completely imbalanced architecture that was going to collapse. So they didn't see the collapse coming. When the collapse... I'm not agree with you. You don't agree with me? I'm not. Why, why you said that... They, they couldn't see it coming. They had no idea it was coming. Why? because they had believed their own propaganda. You see, you know, I'm, uh, as an economist in the, in the 1990s, I spent hours clashing with fellow economists who believed, who were proclaiming the end of risk. They were proclaiming, maybe you remember the term, a riskless risk, huh? because they believed that with financialization, uh, with the creation of these financial engineering derivative models. They were cutting risk up into tiny pieces, the CDOs, the collateralized debt obligations. So, and they, so they cut them up in tiny pieces and they were dispersing them across the world, the globe, which meant that no one was holding too much debt in one pool. And therefore they held a lot of debt, but each morsel of the debt um, corresponded to different people and different bonds and 
some of it was private, some of it was public, some of it was Greek, some of it was Japanese or French. Huh? So they thought that they had created the perfectly balanced capital, financial capitalist model that was beyond um, boom and bust. Remember Gordon Brown, a very smart person who became eventually prime minister in Britain, but he was a finance minister of Britain. He was Labour, he was Social Democrat. A genuine social democrat. He came out with a theory as treasurer, chancellor of the exchequer in Britain, that we now are moving into a period when there will never be crisis again. The end of boom and bust. So they had believed that. Uh, there, there is no, I mean, you said you disagree with me, but please don't, because the, the, the leaders of Lehman Brothers, the CEOs, CFOs, uh, the board of Lehman, could never imagine that Lehman Brothers would go broke. Never. The leaders of the American insurance group could never see it coming. The, you know, the CEO of Barclays Bank, of Societe Generale, could never see that because they were making so much money and they assumed that they were on a conveyor belt, that this was it. Now, the politicians in power from the 1990s onwards were in power because they were the ones who were the political mouthpieces of the riskless risk story. I remember even a former communist, Massimo D'Alema, who was Prime Minister of Italy. He had grown up through the, the, the Communist Party of Italy. I remember him coming out in 1996 with a statement. He, he went to, he visited New York City and he saw Wall Street in action. He came back saying, you know, I'm a communist or have been a communist all my life, but I have to say that I saw how capitalism works now and it has gone beyond crisis. So the political personnel that were um, whose campaign financing was provided by the bankers, had believed the story of the bankers. My profession, my academic economists, the mainstream, not all of us, but the mainstream, had completely adopted this view of a general equilibrium. Ah, that's the term that they used. So anybody who said that, you know, this is completely imbalanced and in a state of, of precarious disequilibrium was considered to be um, a, an old lefty who is refusing to understand that now we have a new paradigm. That was another expression that they wish. So you asked me, to go back to your original question, why can't they do something about fascism? Well, because before the crisis, they couldn't see the crisis coming. When the crisis came, they panicked, completely panicked. And they operated like firefighters who are in a state of panic, they think they will be consumed by the flames, so they attack the flames, not the center of the epicenter of the fire. Uh, so, for instance, when Greece went bankrupt, the Greek state went bankrupt in 2010, what did they do? They spent hours and hours and hours trying to find out ways of giving money to the Greek treasury so that the Greek treasury could give it to the French and the German banks in order to plug the hole of the French and German banks. And what will happen with the Greek debt, we'll see, we'll, we'll deal with it at some point. So they lied to the parliamentarians in the Bundestag, in your National Assembly here. They said, ah, oh, we'll, this is solidarity with Greece, we'll get the money back. What it was, it was a bailout for Societe Generale and Finance Bank. Eh? So they, they created a huge problem, but they pushed it into the future. Okay, so the, put it under the carpet. <laughs> they put it exactly like, like stupid children. They break a vase and put it under the carpet, thinking it's gone away. So, uh, so okay. So, number one priority when the crisis that they had never expected to happen happened was to um, plug the holes of the banking system that was financing them, financing their political parties, their governments, even some financing that was quite humane and quite, you know, socially acceptable, like, for instance, Gordon Brown, whom I mentioned earlier, was funding the National Health Service out of the City of London's taxes. So there was a Faustian bargain between the Social Democrats in power at the time in Britain, but also in Germany and elsewhere, and here. Uh, the Faustian bargain was, we turn a blind eye, let the bankers do whatever they want, because they know how to handle risk. It's riskless, after all. And we take a few crumbs of, of their huge profits to fund hospitals. But the moment that, you know, those, all of those banks went bankrupt, every single bank in Europe went bankrupt in 2008, 2009, 2010. So we don't put uh, the Glass-Steagall Act just after it. 
What, what, the Glass-Steagall Act. You know what it's a Glass-Steagall yeah, Act? Yeah, of course I know what the Glass-Steagall Act. Because, they, they, you know, they had, they were in power because they had take, taken the Glass-Steagall Act out. They were in power because they were representing the financial sector. And when the financial sector went under, they lacked, number one, they lacked the analytical capacity to understand what happened and to confront with this analytical knowledge. You know, Roosevelt in 1933 knew what had happened in 1929. He was elected uh, in order to confront the bankers. He had said, especially in the 1936 campaign, the bankers hate me and I consider their hatred to be a badge of honor for me. Yeah? The Sarkozy, Lagarde, Schroeder, Gordon Brown, Papandreou in Greece, yeah? they were being financed by these people. They had believed that banking was safe. So when it goes down and the phone call comes, says, you know, Prime Minister, President, Chancellor, the ATMs will stop functioning today until we give them 600 billion euros in Germany, 200 billion euros here in, in France, unless we give money to the Greek state to give to, to our banks. At that point, these people who didn't understand what happened were panicking. And they said, okay, we'll plug those holes because we can't have the ATMs not working. So they did whatever it takes to keep the ATMs. But whatever it takes meant socialism for the bankers and austerity for everybody else. And when you create this kind of large-scale austerity in the middle of the worst crisis in 1929, what you are creating is the economic conditions for the birth or rebirth of fascism. And then you can't stop the fascists because you've given birth to them. They are your children. Um, even if you don't like them, even if you want to kill them, okay, you just can't. So, so, you know, and also there was wishful thinking. Ah, these are marginal people. Golden Dawn in Greece. What would they do? You know, Le Pen, she will never get elected. Maybe she won't. But Le Pen does not need to get elected. She has poisoned French politics without being elected. She made Francois Hollande push legislation through your National Assembly that is racist. She doesn't have to win the Elysee in order to be in power. The fascists are in power even if they don't win government. And those who, you know, the, and what happens to the Hollands of the world, to the Merkels of the world? They fade away like Hindenburg in the 1930s. They get swept away. They feel the Weimar Republic. They felt they were con in control. They felt, ah, Hitler, we can control him, even use him. No, you cannot, you know, breed the beast or, you know, allow the serpent's egg to hatch and then control it. Uh, let me interrupt you. Sorry for, um, for my French accent, so I'm going to take my French accent. But sorry I, for my Greek accent. No, no, I, uh, we love it. <laughs> we love it. So, don't you think that our middle political party feed the beast when they don't uh, listen to the referendum, when they screw people with referendum, when they make votes, when they make them vote again? People don't uh, forget that. What is your opinion about referendum? Well, I believe very strongly in uh, moving towards a Swiss model in Europe, a combination of a parliamentary process, especially a federal parliamentary process, with very frequent direct democracy actions like referendum. But that's something we need to be educated at. If you look at the, the United Kingdom, or the Britain, you know, they had three referenda all, you know, since the beginning of time. Uh, one was in 1975 to validate the membership of the European Common Market. Then they had another referendum for proportional representation that didn't go very well. And then they had the Brexit referendum in 2016. When you have a, a referendum every 10, 20 years, uh, citizens are not trained to, to, to work, whereas the Swiss, they have one every week. So, how, how do you explain that the population are, is not trained to, to express their citizen voice? This is because of the media, because of the politics, no. because of the education system, because of what? No, no, it's because we don't live in democracies. We live in oligarchies. The whole point, you see, we make the mistake of thinking, let me speak as a Greek now for a moment, we make the mistake of thinking that our democracy is a successor to Athenian democracy. It is not. Athenian democracy, 
It only lasted for a few decades. And it was very flawed in the sense that the women didn't vote, the slaves didn't vote, of course. Not even the, the migrants voted. But at least it was very interesting in the sense that uh, the majority in the, of the demos, the, of the citizens who had the vote, were poor. So it was a, Aristotle defined Athenian democracy as a system where the poor govern, cur courtesy of being the majority. And on the basis of Isigoria, that is that the right to be heard and for their views to be judged on the basis of their merit, not on the basis of who you are. Now, that was a remarkable experiment. Uh, flawed, but remarkable. Our democracies, the French Republic, the Greek Republic now, the United States Constitution, British Parliament, and so on, this is a direct descendant of the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was not about democracy. It was about the right of the barons and the lords to keep their loot from the king. So effectively, we, our oligarchy is an extension. That's my understanding of it. It's an extension of the right of the barons, whether they are the landed gentry or these days industrialists, bankers, and so on, uh, to keep their money, to keep their privileges in an association with the state, with the people, providing through a process of consultation, irregular consultation, the democratic legitimacy for the oligarchy. If you read the Federalist Papers upon which the American Constitution, which is a beautiful piece of text, it's a beautiful text, the American Constitution, you read it and, and you feel, I feel, uh, elated as, as, as a Democrat. They can but, kick their debt. In, it is but the Federalist Papers that explain the whole point, the whole point is how to keep, to prevent the demos from ruling. For how to give them a sense that every four years they get consulted, right? But of course they don't rule. We have checks and balance. So our democracy, you say, you know, why is it that people are not schooled? Why are we not trained in democracy? Because we live in a system, the purpose of which is to keep the demos out of democracy and to give the demos a sense of being consulted, of having power when they don't. Uh, and especially with the European Union. If you look at the, Europe, the, way, the construction of the European Union, the European Union was created like a cartel of big business and big interests. The purpose of which was to keep even national parliaments with the limited consultation processes out of serious decision making. So, you know, Brussels is not, um, doesn't suffer from a democratic deficit. It's like saying that the moon suffers from an oxygen deficit. There's no oxygen deficit on the moon. There's no oxygen. Similarly, there's no democracy in Brussels at all. And it's not meant to be there. The European Parliament is there in order to provide a cover uh, for the fact that, all the, that this is a cartel operating in the interest of big business. So we need to, to, to keep fighting to push this frontier back in order to have um, small, tiny victories for the demos so that the demos can be reinserted into our democracies. And referenda are one such example. And, you know, look at Ireland, for instance. Remember the Lisbon Treaty? <laughs> okay, they asked the Irish people to vote. And they said no. So they asked them to vote again. And they would keep asking them until they give, they give the right answer. Remember our referendum in Greece in, on 5th of July 2015? Okay. Um, unfortunately, my friend and prime, prime minister, Tsipras. Tsipras, asked the people to vote, hoping that they would vote against us. So he would legitimize his uh, surrender. They didn't vote against us, they voted for us. So what did he do that, that evening? He surrendered, <laughs> nevertheless, and uh, completely um, overturned the, the people's verdict. So when you have um, incidents like you know, the, the, the Irish referendum, the Greek referendum, um, what you end up with is, is um, uh, cynicism. You feed the beast? You feed the beast. Then you allow Salvini and Le Pen to pre 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 present themselves as the champions of democracy. And, and, and that is a, a major defeat for democracy. So you just explained to me that the European Union is like a cartel of, uh, of the mafia. The, don't you remember the first name of the European Union? The first name of the European Union? The president of the... F no, no, the first name. What did we call the European Union before it was called the European Union? L'Union des Six, no? The it Union was called the European Communities of Coal and Steel. Exactly. That's a cartel. 
a cartel of like OPEC. OPEC is a cartel for oil. oil. The European Union was a cartel for coal and steel. Uh, then after that, they brought in the car makers. After that, they got in the French farmers, the large scale French, French, French farmers through the common agricultural policy. It was all a cartel that was expanding and which needed free trade and a common currency to function. Like, you know, OPEC needs a common currency, which is a dollar in the case of oil, and it needs free trade of oil in order to, for OPEC to function. I mean, this is how we construct the European Union. I'm not criticizing it. Maybe it was a good idea. Maybe, maybe Schumann and Monet and all these people were right that it was the only way to stop war. But let's be honest with each other. We did not create a European Union of European peoples. We created a European Union of car makers, steel producers, you know, large-scale farming, banking, okay? And then we created the European Parliament, which is the only parliament in the history of the world that does not have the right to legislate in order to legitimize all that. Now, I'm not against the European Union. Do you want to stay on it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You want to stay in the cartel? Ah, this is where I disagree with Jean-Luc Mélenchon and other comrades on the left. Because, you know... Jean-Luc Mélenchon wants to stay in the European Union. Well, not last time I spoke to him. It was when? <laughs> yes, 2015. But look, it's, it's very well known that DiEM25, our movement, and elements of the left that fall under the Lexit, left-wing exit uh, banner. And it's a, it's a legitimate argument. I'm, I, I don't believe in, in... I believe that we should have open, frank discussions as comrades. It's a legitimate, legitimate argument. The argument is that, that this European Union sucks, It's horrible, it's neoliberal, it's a cartel of big business, so let's disintegrate it and build democratic socialism within our own country. This is an argument. I thoroughly disagree with that. Because if we, if whatever criticisms we may have about this democracy-free zone that is the European Union, its disintegration, this is DiEM25's position, my position, its disintegration is only going to benefit the fascists. Did you create the, this political party only for uh, saving Greece or to change the Europe from inside? Well, the fact that we inaugurated DiEM25 at the Volksbühne Theater in Berlin answers the question. Uh, it's a pan-European uh, uh, movement. Uh, our line, as Greeks in Greece, is that um, Greece will continue to asphyxiate as long as Europe is disintegrating. And Europe will be disintegrating as long as countries like Greece, France, South France, West France, East France are disintegrating. There is no solution at the level of the nation state. Uh, those who advocate solutions at the level of nation state may be well-meaning, but in the end they feed the beast. Uh, and we have to use, to, to effectively to, to, to take over the institutions of the European Union, not to, to disintegrate them, but to deploy them In the, in the interests of a pan-European progressive agenda. So let me just give you a very simple example. Take the European Investment Bank. Which one? The European Investment Bank, the EIB, uh, the centered in, in Luxembourg. If we didn't have it, we should invent it. The last thing I want to see is the disintegration of the European Investment Bank. I want us to take it over and to, to make it the center of a pan-European Green New Deal that funds the green transition, green investment in energy, transport, um, the transition of industry, the transition of agriculture to a green economy, to the tune of 500 billion euros every year. The European Investment Bank can do it. It has the instruments to do it. I don't want to see it disintegrate. I want us progressives to take it over. Okay, I'm going to, to ask you a, a tough question to Please make a, a, di a diversion. Would you explain to me and to us what is an exponential function? An exponential function? Well, it's any function where the rate of growth follows um, e to the power of x or e to the power of alpha plus beta x. In other words, it is um, a rate of growth that takes off Uh, with increasing speed. So it's like when a, a rate touched the sky. It pierces the sky. Pierces the sky, exactly. <laughs> so you, do you think that it's uh, a su sustainab sustainable system 
to have an exponential growth of the monetary uh, funds in the financial system. No, of course not. Why? Well, I mean, you, let me give you an example of exponential growth, because I did mention our generation's 1929 moment, which happened in 2008. Okay. Year 2001, 2001, remember when the um, the, do, uh, the dot-com bubble burst, the new economy, Nasdaq and so on, came crashing Shit. Down. At that point, the, 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 the Fed, the Federal Reserve, under Alan Greenspan, stabilized, refloated capitalism. That crisis did not last long. During that year, as that crisis was being stabilized by the Federal Reserve, global income, global income, was around 55 trillion. Just say 55, there are too many zeros to worry about. 55. The total size of financial derivatives was 70. Okay? So total income around the world, 55. Total derivatives, 70. 2007, exponential growth. Okay, listen to this. Global income had risen because of globalization from 55 to 70. From in six years, that's a lot. From 55 to 70. Growth in the size, magnitude, volume of derivatives from 70 to 780. So nice. So. To, to put it bluntly, planet Earth was not big enough <laughs> for this bubble. So it burst in 2008. So no, um, every child knows when they are on the beach and they take sand and create a sand hill, well. that if you add more sand at some point, you go there. How do you see the next crisis? Do you see it coming? Oh, look, things are far worse than that. You asked me, how do I see the next crisis? I wish we could have the luxury of answering this question because the previous crisis hasn't gone away. It's not that this, the crisis of 2008 has gone away and now we are bracing ourselves for the next crisis. It's worse, far, far worse. The crisis of 2008 is getting worse. It is proceeding. The more the Davos globalists, the, um, the IMF, the Banque de France, the Buddha's bank and so on, celebrate the end of the crisis and say, oh, now we're, we're the crisis. No. The more you should know that this crisis of 2008 is getting worse, it is metamorphosizing, it takes different forms in different places. So in Germany, it takes the form of very low unemployment, but negative interest rates that eat into the pension funds of the Schwabian housewife, and she turns away from Merkel and supports alternative for Deutschland and racism. In Greece, the Great Depression. Um, in France, you have complete inequality. That is, you have parts of France that are booming and other parts of France that look like Greece. Therefore, the Gilets Jaunes. Know. Yeah, the Gilets Jaunes. Sorry, my French. Um, China is now experiencing a slowdown because of Europe's inability to deal with the crisis that began in 2008. And while we have this crisis, the next one is going to hit us. In but it's going proportion? to hit us while this crisis is continuing. In which proportion? Look, the, the, one, the, 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 the one thing we know is that we can never know what form the next crisis is going to take. So for, let, imagine that we were sitting here, and this was 1982, and we agreed that the Soviet Union is past its uh, use-by date, that the Soviet economy will collapse. Let's say we agreed on that. We were prescient and we were prophetic. Would we be able to predict what form this implosion would take? No. It would be impossible to know to predict that it would be something like you know the combination of the Afghan war, you know Chernobyl, uh, you know the failures of Perestroika, that it would be Yeltsin coming up. It would be impossible to know when and how the crisis would take place. We would know the crisis would take place. You know, in mathematics, there is this term of you know, non-linearities begetting chaotic events. This is precisely what we have. If you put a, hat, a, a gun to my head and you ask me to, to, 
to, to talk about particular fragilities of world capitalism, I can mention three or four. One is the CLOs, not CDOs that we had in, uh, in 2008, but the collateralized uh, uh, loan obligations, that is, uh, very low quality loans taken out by businesses in an environment of zero interest rates that then are collateralized and financial engineering takes them and spreads them around. We, the last time I looked, we have about $1.5 trillion of this. This is a fragility in the financial system that we should be looking at. Uh, secondly, the renationalization of public debt in Europe, in the Eurozone. We are moving precisely the, op the wrong way. So most Italian banks now have only Italian debt in them. Uh, German banks have German debt. French banks have French debt. Greek debt too. No, no, no. All that debt has already been pushed onto your shoulders, onto the shoulders of the weakest taxpayers. That's another crime against logic. Uh, so at least that has been taken off the books of the banks and has been spread onto the shoulders of the poorer taxpayers. This is why I'm so livid at what they did with the Greek debt. Um, and f another source of stability, the third one, and then there will be a fourth one to complete. The third one has to do with the fact that Trump is antagonizing China at a time when he's boosting uh, the budget deficit of the federal government of the United States that requires Chinese investors to buy it. So it's like me antagonizing you at the same time as needing you to buy my debt. A source of fragility, I would say. Eh? And fourth, AI, automation, which is... Um, arti intelligence artificielle. Yeah. Which is um, making the natural crisis-inducing forces within capitalism even more powerful. You, you talk about AI on uh, uh, HFT, hyper uh, trading frequency. Uh, 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 high frequency trading. No, 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 no. No, no. I'm, no, I'm talking about, about automation. I'm talking about the fact that now, take Apple. Hmm? Apple is shifting production now back to the United States. Okay, but if you go and see the factories that they are creating, firstly they are built by robots without construction workers. I saw one outside of Austin in Texas. It was remarkable. It was fascinating, fantastic, and frightening. Because there was a huge construction site with 10 workers. 10, 10. And they were all sitting around tables like this with joysticks. And you could see huge trucks, completely automated, walk, you know, driving past, you know, laying pipes and electric, electrical circuits and so on with no workers. And these factories, when they are com completed, will be building the new Apple laptops with no workers. Now, the problem with those robots is they don't buy Apple laptops. And they don't pay tax. They, yeah, but they don't even buy the stuff. So who's going to buy the stuff? People who are subjected to austerity. So, yeah, capitalism always had this capacity to undermine itself through overproduction, through having a capacity to produce a lot more stuff than the workers can consume. And that always, as Lenin said, and Rosa Luxemburg, very presciently, that always creates imperialistic tendencies because you have to find markets outside of your own capitalist hubs. And that, of course, creates geopolitical problems and so on. But now this is far worse because for the first time in the history of capitalism, new technologies create fewer jobs than they destroy for the first time. Can, can we talk about uh, dark pool? You know what is a dark pool in the financial... Uh Vocabulary, yeah. Yeah. and uh, can we talk about uh, financial escape, financial haven, even? Of course. And if you've got some uh, preconization to fight it. Well, it it really is the simplest thing in the world to do, as long as you have the political will to do it. There is no political will. There is no political will, but technically there is no problem. At the moment, huh, we talk about uh, tax havens. Do you know that, you do know, but let me remind you of something that we all know, but we pretend we don't. That the president of the European Commission was the, the leader of the worst tax haven in the history of the world, right in the middle of Europe. And he has, Mr. Juncker has the audacity to look at the Greeks and say, oh, you, you are cheating on your tax. What? You are the leader of tax cheats. And of tax cheating turned into an industrial 
strength industry, <laughs> enterprise. So we, you know, um, Apple, where are they hiding their profits? In Ireland. How do they do it? On the basis of European Union legislation. With a secret... Uh... So you've got, you've got, an, you know, Holland and Ireland are conspiring with the full support of the European Union to create a system where Apple pays only 2% of its profits in tax. So Cayman Islands is not a problem. Um, you know, Singapore is not a problem. Of course, there are problems. This is, but it is our own legislation and the fact that we are run by elites whose purpose is to create tax havens in the center of Europe, in London, in Ireland, in Luxembourg, in uh, the Netherlands, in order to si siphon off all these profits. So, so your advice, if I summarize uh, correctly your thoughts? I have no advice. You have no advice? No advice. So the because, because, because you say, look, when the, te the technical solution is so simple, uh, and the, the, what is lacking is the political will. Uh, look, remember the, the, the beautiful expression by Stigler that I can never convince somebody whose salary depends on not being convinced. So I'm not going to give advice to somebody who will lose their job if they listen to my advice. So what we do instead of giving advice, we create a political movement to take over those institutions and develop the political will in the center of government in order to end tax havens. It's not a wishful thinking because your political party is so small. Mm. It's, it's, you, you're going to, to do something with your little arms and say, yeah, okay, Luxembourg, uh, pay your tax and uh, no? Well, I think that is what is wishful thinking is to think that we can give advice to Juncker and have Juncker change the world. So why not? That is wishful thinking. That's utopian. So why, why what, you don't why, what I think is far less utopian and far less wishful thinking is to remember that all big changes in the world happen by 10 people who go together and were pissed off and they said, no, we're going to change the world. And then the 10 become 100, 100 become 1,000, and 1,000 become millions. You have time to make, it, to make it happen? I have no idea. <clears throat> What I do know is that unless we try, we'll never find out. <laughs> okay, okay. So <laughs> do we have to invade Luxembourg with our army directly? No, It's more efficient? I hate armies and I hate prisons. That's why Greek uh, bought some But I do uh, believe in, 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 in social army. movements. You know, DiEM25 has a small organization, but very active organization in Luxembourg. Oh, uh, how many people? A hundred thousand. Not in Luxembourg. A <laughs> hundred thousand believe. across Europe. This is our membership. Well, um, you, but no, seriously, you asked me about what, what is the, the solution is to change minds, huh? to use the power of ideas. Uh, there are millions of people out there ready, ready to join a movement that has a clear agenda, an agenda that is not nationalist and it's not specific to a nation state, that is pan-European, which is sensible which is moderate and radical at the same time, because the only way to be moderate these days is to be radical. How do you, how do you communicate, how do you exchange, how do you share with extreme? That you consider that extreme? Well, I'll tell you what. You, I, you talk to, to them like moron, you, like media talk about the extreme? Or no, you, no, 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 no. It's no, a problem, no, that, no? If you're a humanist, you don't have the right to treat anyone like a moron. The great crime of the Democrats in the United States of America, is that they demonize those who voted for Trump. They look at them and they say, you are riffraff, you are third rate, you should not have the vote. Uh, you were idiots. You were duped by Vladimir Putin and Facebook. That is what you do if, firstly, you are misanthropic, and secondly, if you're a fool, because there's no safer way of re-electing Trump than treating Trump supporters, supporters uh, as Untermenschen. What you should do is you should listen to them. Because the majority of people who voted for Trump, the majority of people who voted for Trump, especially in the brown belt areas uh, that determined his victory, had voted for Obama in 2008. So they were not racist. By definition, they were not racist. They were not dumb. What they were are is angry. If you want to understand why people vote for Trump, forget Putin and Facebook. 
and look at one simple statistic. In 2016, for the first time since 1949, more than half of families in America could not afford the cheapest car, which is a Nissan that trades for $14,000. And when I say they can't afford, I don't only mean that they didn't have $14,000 to buy it, they didn't even have enough credit worthiness to get a loan to buy it. And you know, in the United States of America, if you don't own a car, you're dead. You can't go to the supermarket, you can't take your kids to school, and you can't get a job because your, the job is not going to be around the corner. You need a car to go to it. So, in the sense that at the very same time you had extreme money making, in 2016, never before did the top 0.1% have so much money. Uh, and deprivation. This is why Trump managed to win. And because Hillary Clinton at the same time was going around Wall Street and making promises of letting them run riot again, like they were when her husband was president of the United States. So what do you do when you face, I mean, I lived in the United States. I had such experiences. I had the experience of being in a bar with somebody who was in favor of um, um, complete anarchy regarding gun laws. Um, I, I remember meeting a lorry driver uh, who was a great education to me because you know, we, we started, we, uh, my car was being repaired in the middle of nowhere, I think it was in Idaho somewhere. Uh, and I was having a beer with this guy while waiting for my car to be repaired. He, he was having a, a hamburger. Um, and he told me his life story. And it was heart wrenching because you know, he, had, he was a, a businessman who lost, who got sick at some point. He was not insured. He had to spend $250,000. He, so he was bankrupted, he had no insurance, he lost his family, he, he was divorced, and he was in his 60s driving a lorry. And what astonished me was that he turned against Obamacare. He was against socialized health. And I was trying to, to understand that. You were destroyed because of lack of a national health service. And you were against the National Health Service and you were against Obama. He said, yes, because it's a question of pride for me. I do not want the law to tax anyone in order to look after me. What I am very angry about is that I couldn't look after myself. Now, if at that point you look at this guy and you say, you're a moron, you're a fascist, you're an idiot, at that point you're committing a crime against humanism and you lose him. What do you need to do at that point? You need to reason with him. You, need to, to, you have to learn from him. His sense of dignity is important. If you don't try to understand and get a feel for his sense of dignity, Trump will. So we have a duty, like we did in the 1930s. People did not become Nazis in the 1930s. No. Hitler promised them a job. He said to them, I will give you back dignity. We of the left failed to compete against Hitler's narrative. So instead of turning against the people who are a manifestation of our failure, we should think twice about how we are going to approach those people. What is your point of view about Macron and the yellow jacket, the gilet jaune? It's a crime against uh, the social uh, part? It's, it's like what? It's, uh, well, for like me, the gilet jaune are the children of austerity. And the children of austerity... Um, can be wrong in the way they express their anger, like all children that scream and shout when wronged. The children, no? Oh yeah, of course, we're all children. But the gilets jaunes in particular are the children of austerity. They are the products of austerity. Now, it's a, of it's a, a long dogma. story. No, it's a product of a dogma. No, no, it's a product of austerity. What? Austerity Look. is not a dogma? No, it's a practice. It is a it's a practice. It's it's very tangible. It's not an idea. It, austerity is an idea as well. Ideology, no. Everything is an ideology. But the gilets jaunes did not do what they did because somebody had an idea. They do are doing what they did because the pra the policies that were um, developed in the laboratory of bleakness that is Greece. The policies of austerity that were first tried out in my country and developed before taken by the same Troika and transplanted 
to Ireland, to Portugal, to Spain, uh, to Italy, and eventually to France and to Germany. Yeah? These policies, in the middle of the worst investment crisis in the history of capitalism, this is, this is very important to note. I've had this, this discussion with Emmanuel Macron before he became president. This was a, a disagreement that the, the two of us had. This is your buddy, no? no? He's not my buddy. But when I was in government, he was the only decent person that I came across from the French government. And, you know, wh why should I hide it? He was smart and he was supportive. He understood that what was happening in Greece was detrimental to the interest of Europe and to the interest of France. So he, he tried a little bit to help us. François Hollande slapped him down, and down he stayed. <laughs> but I appreciate the fact that he tried, and that in our conversations he was supportive. Um, but going back to, to, to the situation in France, I'll tell you where my, my great dis disagreement with him was about France. And it has to do with austerity. Now, the first country to have practiced austerity was Germany, before 2008, under Schroeder. Hmm? It was a time when we had the, the, uh, the rules of the Eurozone facing us. Remember, 2% inflation, 3% okay? um, maximum deficit for the budget, 60% of GDP in terms of debt. Huh? And what does Schroeder do at a time when Germany was the sick man of Europe, if you remember, because of high unemployment? Eh? He pushes wages down and cuts down on public expenditure. At a time when the United States of America, and Wall Street in particular, was creating a massive boost in financialization, in expenditure, um, so the world was going crazy with debt, 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 um, debt-fueled expansion, and Germany was shrinking its wages and its public sector. At that point, Germany gained competitiveness vis-à-vis -vis France and the rest of Europe, of the Eurozone. But this is a, a little bit like free riding, uh, because when we have a 2% inflation rate target, that, that was the agreed target. France was the only country that had exactly that, hit the target. Okay? Greece was at 5%, 4%, 3% above, so was Italy, so was Spain. Germany was at 0.8%. Immediately, French business is at a disadvantage vis-à-vis -vis German business. So this is a, huh? so austerity during a period of growth, whether it's debt fuel growth or not, doesn't matter, but the period of growth internationally, austerity in one country allows it to gain a competitive advantage vis-à-vis -vis other countries. So austerity can work during non-austerian times because you are stealing business from your neighbors. This is what it does. Huh? And Emmanuel understood this perfectly well. And, effective, and I've heard him, he was next to me when he was saying to other people, in agreement with me that the problem in Europe is that we are playing a competitiveness game and not a productivity game. Because productivity is a game where we can all win. Competitiveness is a, is a zero-sum game. Some win, some lose. Right. So where is my disagreement with? Where was my disagreement with, with, with Macron? It was in that when I asked him, so if, if you become president, what do you intend to do? He said, well, we need to change the architecture of the Eurozone in ways that I agreed with. We need a common budget, we need a way of recycling deficits and, and, uh, and uh, surpluses, we need a common unemployment insurance, we need a common investment program, massive investment program that takes surpluses from wherever they, they are and channels them as green investments, especially in the deficit regions. We agreed on that. Where do you disagree? It was in the way that he was going to implement it. His, plan was, and he tried to, to, to implement that plan. He failed. Yeah, badly. And I was telling him he was going to fail, and I'll explain to you why I, I thought he was going to fail. His plan was a bargain with Merkel. And the bargain was very simple. I will Germanize French labor through austerity, 
and you will give, give me a federal budget. And what I said to Emmanuel if, about a year before he became president was, it's not going to work. Because if you sequence it this way, you will Germanize French labor, and then America will say, thank you very much for doing that, but you're getting nothing from me. And then your, and this is a big disagreement. He said, well, at least I will have created more competitiveness for France. And no, because it worked in the 90s in Germany because the rest of the world was boosting investment. In a world where investment is at the lowest level in relation to accumulated savings, in the history of capitalism, imposing austerity upon France will simply depress France and it will depress France unequally. Different parts of France will be depressed in different ways. And you are going to be presiding over an explosion within your country. And your European agenda is going to fail. And this is exactly what happened. And the gilets jaunes, as far as I'm concerned, are the result of this Germanization of French labor, of austerity, imposed upon France in circumstances of very low, low investment. I'm going to, to ask you, 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 talk, you talk about uh, the influence of the Russian in the United States during the Trump election. Or the non-influence of the Russians in the United States. Your point I think this is all rubbish. Yeah, tell me why. You know, people say, Putin changed the election result in the United States. I said, no, he didn't. It was people who voted for Obama in 2008 who voted for Trump in 2016. And the, the people who actually um, ensured that Trump would win... And the media said that uh, the, the Russian boost the anger of the, the, the redneck people. Listen, Vladimir Putin is sitting in, on his gilded chair in Moscow listening to all that. He's laughing his head off. Hello, Vladimir. He is laughing his head off. He, see, he think, You know what he thinks when he hears this? These idiots, they give me so much credit. I wish I had this power. So what, what People say to me, but he did try to influence the, the, the American election. I said, yeah, so did I. I tried to influence the American election. I failed. <laughs> and, and I can assure you that Putin did not succeed in, in Brexit. They do the same thing about Brexit. They keep arguing that it was Russian money that, and Facebook that uh, tilted the referendum result in favor of Brexit. I campaigned in Britain against Brexit. I gave 13 speeches in 13 cities before Brexit, against Brexit. I can tell you that it was not Putin and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. It was all the supporters of Remain, people like Tony Blair, David Cameron, Christine Lagarde, Wolfgang Schäuble, Every time they opened their mouth to threaten the Brits, if you vote for Brexit, Armageddon is coming, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, Brexit will win. Shut up. Can't you just shut up? If you shut up, we would defeat Brexit. Every time you warn the Brits against Brexit, yeah, with a German accent, or coming from Washington, D.C., or Obama. Obama came to Britain to tell the big people of Britain that they should vote to remain in the EU. I thought... This, if I was a Brexiteer, this would be the greatest gift anyone can give me. Uh, because the last thing the people of Britain need is somebody to tell them that if they do X, they will be punished. This is like saying to them, do X. Because they, you know, you, you know the Brits have the blitz mentality. You say to them that we will punish you. They say, okay, back her off. We will do it and you punish us and see who is going to win in the end. Um, and also, I'll tell you why Brexit won. Because of the way Greece was treated in 2015. Now that may sound far-fetched to you, but it is not. If you think that Brexit won by 1.8%, 1.8%. I mean, of course, there are many right-wingers who don't give a damn about Greece that would have voted for Brexit. But the difference was this 2%. And I remember an old lady, old socialist, trade unionist, coming up to me in a town called Doncaster. Or oh, actually, no, it wasn't Doncaster, it was in Leeds. She came up to me after a speech I gave, a fiery speech against Brexit from a left-wing perspective. 
saying that the European Union sucks, it's horrible, it's all that, but we have to stay in because we need to transform it, not to disintegrate it. My standard spiel. She comes up to me and says, Yanis, when you resigned, I cried. I love everything you say and everything you do, but I'm not going to do as you say. I'm going to vote for Brexit because of the way your people were treated, the way that you were forced to surrender, the way you were treated personally. Because we are Democrats above all. And we prefer to be poor than to have somebody in Brussels telling us that if we give a little bit more money to the poor, the ATMs will be closed down by the European Central Bank. I am not going to stay in a European Union that is dictatorial and treats people like your people the way it did. And I can assure you, there were lots of people like that in Britain. Wherever I went, I, there was another, again an old lady, this time in Doncaster, that I mentioned before. And she came up to me and he said, she said, look, your narrative that we should stay in the European Union and transform it is fantastic. But Yanis, you are not our prime minister. David Cameron is. David Cameron is telling us to vote to stay in because he wants to maintain this corrupt establishment in London and in Brussels. If you or Jeremy Corbyn or whoever were in 10 Downing Street, yes, I would vote to stay in the European Union and reform it. But I'm not going to give them the satisfaction of voting to remain in order for them to continue business as usual. Now, that is why Brexit won. Not Facebook, not Putin. So to go back to my previous question, how do you explain that in the European Union, the media told us that there is a troll farm from Russia who tried to interfere in uh, our local political uh, election, that there is a, a huge, huge uh, uh, money spending on propaganda from Russia? What's Because it's true. It's there true. is all that. But it's irrelevant. I, you know, I don't think people are stupid. I really don't think people are stupid. In Greece, okay, in the summer of 2015, we had called for a referendum and we were campaigning for no. For no to the ultimatum from the Troika. Even though the Prime Minister wanted the yes, but at least we were going out there campaigning. Some of us were campaigning with our heart in favor of no. Every single television channel was portraying us, me personally, as uh, the devil incarnate. The Russian agent. No, 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 no. no. As the devil. No, I was a devil without any connections to, to, to Putin, right? I was a person who wanted to take Greece out of the European Union, who wanted to turn Greece into a wasteland. Uh, there were even images of me. They, uh, a few days before the referendum, there was a forest fire, like we have in July in Greece regularly. And I remember somebody showing me a video of... Um, the camera filming the flames, horrible, you know, a horrible image of the burning trees and the black smoke with a picture of me superimposed and underneath he wants to destroy the, this country. Uh, so if you vote for no, for the no option, uh, the country will be decimated, Armageddon will be out, we will join Venezuela and Iran and North Korea, all that. And what did the people of Greece do? 62% no. So, this, so I'm giving you as an example of how smart people are, that they manage to see through the propaganda. They, you know, people are not idiots. Even if Putin spent huge quantities of money, even if he influenced the BBC itself, people would not be guided. By, think of Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn was demonized beyond belief. Before the elections, the, the last general election in 2017, Every single television channel was portraying him as an idiot, as dangerous, as a complete failure, as somebody who is going to destroy the Labour Party and give it the worst possible general election result in the history of the world. Huh? And he got the best result since 1945. So the people are not that dumb. So I have no doubt that Putin tried to interfere. In the same way, I have no doubt the United States has interfered in my country, like for instance, you know, affecting a coup d'etat in 1967 that saw half of my family being imprisoned. Yeah, 
they were a bit more effective than Putin. <laughs> well, or at least as effective as the Soviet Union was in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. So we've seen all that. Um, but I really laugh at the uh, suggestion that Putin has any significant influence on any election or referendum result. What, what, what Brussels is doing is trying to explain the inexplicable. Failure. Their own failure. The fact that they lost Britain. I mean, for God's sakes, they lost Britain. And why did they lose Britain? Because of the colossal economic mismanagement of the Euro crisis. This is why they lost Britain in the end. Because if you think about it, from the moment the huge crisis hit in 2008, the idiotic European Central Bank was practicing contractory monetary policy. It was contract... Trichet, Frenchman, the worst central banker in the history of the universe, huh? was increasing interest rates while the world of, fi of ca financialized capitalism was collapsing. And he did it again in 2011. You had contractionary monetary policy and austerity in the middle of a crisis. Whereas in Britain, at least the Bank of England was printing money as if there is no tomorrow. So what happens? One million Europeans move to Britain. Okay? And that created tensions in parts of Britain that were suffering from their own austerity. So this is why, and at the same time, they performed effectively a coup, a coup d'etat against our government in 2015. This is why they lost Britain. And then they blame it on Putin. Okay, they have to blame it on someone. Let's continue about uh, the prism of economic war. What is, what is your opinion about China? And what is your opinion about the predatory, uh, the predatory uh, mind of the China on the, the European assets? And especially in the Greek assets, in, uh, in the French uh, assets, like airport or stuff like that, or port? Look, again... Don't believe everything. You see me coming. You, you see me coming. Of course. Don't believe everything you read. The Chinese are very sensible compared to the French, compared to the Greeks, compared the Greek oligarchies. I mean, huh? the Chinese rulers are far smarter and more sensible and moderate than the U.S. authorities, the U.S. Olig oligarchy, the French oligarchy, the German oligarchy. I wish our oligarchies were as smart as the Chinese one. Uh, maybe that's why they've got a free press in China, no? No, they don't have a free, free press in China, but you know what? We don't have a free press in, in Greece. In France? Oh, you tell me. You, uh, I'm very pleased I'm speaking to an independent uh, outlet, uh, and I, I think that is my answer to your question about France. But I, I'll tell you, I'll, let me tell you about Greece. Greece it, it has the television, radio, and newspaper um, industry that looks extremely competitive in the sense that there are many of them. One line. One line that is completely informed by the fact that they are all bankrupt and they all survive on the basis of advertisements that come from the banks that are bankrupt, which survive on the basis of money, money that comes from the Troika. So, hmm, the Chinese at least are more honest. They have a Chinese Communist Party and they give the line. <laughs> they don't even pretend to have a pluralist press like we do here in Europe. No, but look, let me first, a, a small preface, so that I'm not uh, misunderstood when I tell you what my answer to your question about China is. Uh, I disdain the tyranny of the Communist Party, the fact that there are political prisoners, the way minorities are being treated, the fact that if you're a dissident, you disappear. The lack of free press. Let's be clear. That is unacceptable. We will fight against it. Okay? Point number one. Point number two. Um, we must be very careful before we accuse others of uh, tyrannical and oligarchic anti-democratic processes, especially the Chinese, when here in Europe, Democracy is a figment of our imagination. In my first Eurogroup meeting, I put this down in my book. I remember... Which one? Adults in the room. Yeah, others in the room, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I remember um, I had a discussion with Michel Sapin, your finance minister at the time, in which uh, I outlined to him what I would say in my first Eurogroup meeting. And he was very happy with it because I was going to be very moderate. And I would say, listen, folks, I know you probably don't like the fact that I'm here. 
that we were elected because we were a left-wing government. You have a program for Greece and you are insisting on this. And we have a completely different program about Greece. So let's sit down, put the two programs side by side and have a genuine conversation about how to find common ground. Your program has failed. This is why I was elected. I was not elected because Greeks suddenly became left-wingers. I was elected because your program failed. We have a program, maybe it's, it, it's silly. Maybe you think it's silly. Um, I think there are good parts in it. Can we have a discussion, please, like adults? Sit down. So I said that in the Eurogroup meeting. And Michel, I said that in the Eurogroup meeting. And Michel was happy. And he came out and he said, oh, this is the right way to do it and so on. And then Wolfgang Schäuble demanded the floor. And he said, verbatim, elections cannot be allowed to change economic policy in Greece. At which point I took the floor and said, this is fantastic news to the Communist Party of China, because they believe too that elections should not, allow, should not be allowed to change economic policy or any policy. Okay? So before we are too critical of the Chinese Communist Party, let's remember the kind of polity we have created in Europe and what is being said on your behalf, my behalf by our elected politicians, and what are you doing in the end? Because Wolfgang Schäuble's line prevailed. It was not Michel Sapin's line. Huh? It was Schäuble's line that prevailed, and which continues to prevail. So, okay. So, so Now, let me answer your question, though, about China. And, and about the asset, and about... Uh, yeah. Okay. Look. Uh, the Chinese have a project. And their project is to lift China out of poverty. They've had this project since 1979, 1980, and they are succeeding. They have a business model which had to fit into... At which price? Well, uh, let, let's consider that. But, th that's for, you know, but that is a project. Uh, what you're talking about side effects. You're talking about the cost of it. Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter, however, is that they had to fit that project within globalism, globalized capitalism. How well did they do that? I think they did it superbly. They spread the global... Uh, they did it superbly and they did it in a way that they have saved us. They have saved us. We, not you and me necessarily, but French capitalism, Uh, the, the captains of industry and, and banking here, they should have a portrait of the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party on their wall. And every day, they say, thank you, thank you, thank you. When 2008 hit your banking system here and destroyed it, and Wall Street and the city of London and so on, two things saved capitalism, global capitalism. Two things prevented it from completely destroying itself. The Fed, hmm, the Fed, and the fact that they printed money as if there's no tomorrow and gave it to the French banks. So they gave it to the German banks. Huh? Because the French banks and the German banks had bets that were dollar denominated of more than one and a half trillion dollars in dollars that they didn't have. And it was the Fed that gave them that money. Effectively covered their, their backside to put it politely. That was one factor that prevented the well-to-do people here who are criticizing the Chinese and the Americans from being poverty-stricken today. The second factor was China. Because neither the United States government nor the European Union had what it took politically to create a boost in aggregate demand at a global level. The Europeans, because they were in a mess with the Eurozone and the rules of the fiscal compact and so on, of Maastricht back then, and the United States because they don't have a government in the United States, right? They have something resembling a government. You have the Congress going against the President, the President going against the Congress. The, 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 it's very hard for them to make any, any decisions along the lines of boosting aggregate demand. The Fed can operate on its own. So it was the Chinese that boosted their investment from a very high already 32% of GDP to 51% of GDP. Never before has investment reached that high level. Why did they do that? In order to stabilize global, the, the global economy. So we owe, the, the fact that we didn't have a complete collapse in 2008, we owe it to the Chinese. 
Okay? So let's remember that before we are too critical. Especially the French oligarchy needs to be very respectful of the Chinese authorities. We of the left, who are, you know, on the streets, we can be more critical of them than they have the right to be of the Chinese. Those who are concerned about their assets and... Uh, remember, your assets exist because of the Chinese and the Fed, not because of anything that happened in Paris. Point number one. Okay, point, point number two. Let me compare and contrast from my own experience this predatory behavior of the, of, of the Chinese. As part of their project of lifting China out of poverty, they have their plan for the Silk Route, for maintaining a line, a trade route, from China all the way to the heart of Europe. And the port of Piraeus was a central element of that. Okay? Now, when I moved into the government uh, in January of 2015, I had already inherited a Troika program, that is Berlin, Paris, Frankfurt, Brussels being behind it, that I should sell, and when I say I, I mean the Minister of Finance because I had to sign for it, uh, the port of Piraeus to the Chinese for peanuts, without any kind of restrictions, any kind of conditions. My party was against any involvement with the Chinese, with Costco, none. And they considered me to be right-wing because I said, hang on a second, we need to discuss with the Chinese conditions that could make this collaboration fruitful both for the Chinese and for us. And I initiated a dialogue with the Chinese government. And I said to them, I don't care about the price that you pay for the port. It's not too bad, it's not, it's, it's not enough, but that's not my number one priority. I have three conditions for you before I, I even discuss selling it to you. Condition number one, that the workers who work in the port uh, are not subcontracted and that they have full union rights and they get the living wage. And, that, yeah, and you do not treat them like you've been, you've been treating them in Italy and elsewhere. So, you want to be communist? Be communists. We're going to have a proper trades union representation and, you're going to, and we agree on minimum standards, which is what you do when Volkswagen comes to Shanghai you set minimum standards for Volkswagen. Well, I want to do the same thing with you. They agreed. Secondly, you're going to spend, if you get the port, 180 million euros in 18 months. Investment. Minimum investment. You take the port, you invest in it. To create new jobs, new facilities, upgrade it. Huh? To be a good steward of that. Number three. Number three. Uh, our country is in the clasps of vicious creditors. We need a loan of 10 billion from your government to help us along the way of getting out of our debt prison. And we need 1.5 billion of that to, to come immediately because we have pensions, to, uh, not pensions, but we had actually repayments to make to the International Monetary Fund and so on. And number four, in addition, that this should be part of a long-term strategic partnership where you start investing in our trains, because we have 19th century trains in Greece, uh, technology parks, you bring Foxconn here, here to start producing stuff rather than simply using Greece as a conduit. They agreed on everything. On everything. Uh, no. And the, 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 the continuation of this story is tragic. So much so that we sent the Deputy Prime Minister to, to, to Beijing to sign, to monograph the agreement. It all happened. He comes back and the next morning I was expecting 1.5 billion to come to the Treasury as we had agreed. It didn't. Only 100 million came. And I thought, Bastards, they, they reneged. Then they promised it would come back, it, that they would make the rest of the payment three days later. To cut a long story short, I spoke to the authorities and they confessed to what had happened. They had received a telephone call from Berlin, cease and desist any agreement with the Greeks. Hmm? Because we want to invite first on it. Because we need to deal with them first. 
And what happened when I resigned after the surrender of our government to the Troika? Berlin instructed my prime minister to sign the original deal that had none of those conditions. So effectively, the heart of Europe, eh, our decision makers in Europe, went to the, went, imposed upon both the Greek government and the Chinese government a transfer of a major asset of Greece to the Chinese under conditions that were worse for Europe and worse for Greece uh, and worse for the Chinese than what the Chinese were prepared to accept. So when we, I hear Macron and Merkel talk about the predatory behavior of the Chinese, I take this with a gigantic pinch of salt. Yes? Right. Beyond that. Look, the world we live in is a world where cartels are fighting one another. You saw what happened with Alstom and Siemens. They want to create an even bigger cartel in Europe. They're even, you even have Macron attacking the European Commission for having pre pre prevented an even greater concentration of industrial power and monopoly within Europe. These are games that people play. This is, this, is, this is the name of the game in this techno-structure that we live in. I use techno-structure, this is John Kenneth Galbraith term, to replace the word capitalism, because we don't live in capitalism anymore. We live in a techno-structure where you've got a centrally planned system planned by large-scale monopolies. In this context, the way that the Chinese have been behaving is far more moderate and far more palatable than the way that French capital, American capital, and German capital has been behaving. Okay, let's talk now about refugees, wool, and uh, stuff like that. What's happened in Greece with the refugees? Do you, are you optimistic about uh, the next wave of uh, refugees uh, from the economical crisis, from the climate crisis? What do we do with this uh, problem? We open the border? Yes. Like what? Let them in. In which proportion? Let in every proportion. Look, we Europeans are guilty. Full stop. We are criminals. We are criminals at a planetary scale. And we are lying to ourselves. We need a reality check. And we need a morality check. For 1,000 years, We have destroyed the planet. We have colonized the world. We have sent our troops and our colonizers to Latin America, to North America, to Central America, to Asia, to Australia, to New Zealand, everywhere, to Africa. How could I have not mentioned Africa? Huh? It was our right for a thousand years to be migrants and to be the worst kind of migrants, where we export guns, death, germs, steel, Dog. chemicals, huh? and we take anything we want. What happened was, after those 1,000 years, our continent is getting older. And the demographic dynamics get swapped, get reversed. It is only natural that younger people will be coming from the rest of the world to us. Now, there are two things we can do. Build a huge wall or let them in. There's nothing else. Everything else is dumb, <laughs> and that, that doesn't work. Now, Le Pen, the fascists, eh, they want a big wall. Hillary Clinton, the other day, advised us Europeans that the only way to defeat Le Pen is by building the wall ourselves. That's why she does not deserve to be president of the United States. Yeah? Now, what happens when you build a wall? All that happens is the profits of the traffickers increase. The deaths increase, but nothing changes in the end. You cannot stem the human tide by building walls. All you do is you boost misanthropy and the profits of the bad people. That's all you do. And the other thing is you create more toxic politics within your country. Because the problem is that every time you, you build a wall, well, the, the, our polity and society within the wall gets even more unsafe becomes even more introverted, becomes even more ill at ease with ourselves. It was a sign of strength in ancient Greek cities 
when they decided to demolish the wall. Every time a son of uh, Corinth or Thebes won an Olympic event, they would demolish part of the wall as a sign of the fact that they are more confident. It is only a Europe that lacks confidence that builds walls. As for the Greek situation, if you go to Lesbos today and you go to Moria, you will see the misanthropy of Europe in action. We are keeping people in conditions of a concentration camp. They are dying, they are suffering, when a fraction of a portion of a percentage of the money that we spent on the banks <laughs> would have made their conditions livable. Yeah? But we keep them in those dehumanizing conditions on purpose. It is on purpose. It is not a failure of bureaucracy. It's not corruption. No. We are keeping them in hell on purpose so that they can send a message to people in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Nigeria, in Ghana, from wherever they are. Don't come. A Europe that is doing that is destroying its own soul. We don't deserve to exist when we behave like that. Think of the European Union, Turkey Treaty or Agreement that Angela Merkel negotiated in 2015 after having let courageously one million Syrians come into Germany and almost losing the chance, you know, her, her position um, from the backlash within the Christian Democratic Party. Think of what we did. We bribed President Erdogan of Turkey to the tune of six billion euros. We gave an increasingly deranged, dictatorial president of Turkey, six billion euros, so that he would allow us to violate international law on refugees. Because now if, you, if you're a refugee and you get, end up in Lesbos, you cannot apply for asylum as a refugee. You have to be sent to Turkey to do it. You are never assessed as a refugee, even if you've been tortured for political reasons, whatever. That is a violation of international legislation. So we have allowed Erdogan to permit us to violate international legislation by paying him to, to do it. Now, how can we consider this to be uh, a policy that is consistent with the image that Europeans want of themselves? So our position is very simple as DiEM25. Let them in. We don't have a migration crisis in Europe. We do not, we will never have a migration crisis in Europe. We are a gigantic continent, mostly an empty continent, right? Mostly an empty continent. If you look at even large parts of Greece, villages, the whole land, yeah, Italy, uh, here in France, in, in Poland, people have left. They are not there. We have large spaces where the richest part of the world, okay, the problem we have is that we don't, is that we don't have a European Union. Let's we have a problem of migrants concentrating on the Greek islands in Lampedusa, in Sicily, because we don't have a European Union. Let's talk about uh, the financial model. What is your opinion of uh, a degrow uh, system? Do we have to be in a degrow system or do we have to be in a grow, growing system? And what is your opinion about uh, the energy crisis and the lack of uh, resources? Well, I think it's crucial that we separate two concepts, growth and prosperity. This generation's task is to separate the two. Prosperity without physical growth. We need to stop physical growth. We cannot have more cars on this planet, especially the large SUVs. Huh? No more diesel. No more extraction of fossil fuels. Yes to more green energy. Yeah? This is not greenwashing, this kind of uh, no vlong? No, it's not. Because what I'm saying is this. If we were in a spaceship... Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are. Yes. So, but, but it's easier to think of ourselves in a, in a spaceship that is more confined in order to make the point. So let's say we have a spaceship and we decide... Uh, our scientists tell us, our engineer, 
that our oxygen is running out or that we don't have enough capacity to, you know, to, uh, to, to run around in a spaceship in a scooter. So what do we do? We create caps on CO2 and other gas productions. And we, we, you know, generally, we introduce limits to physical growth of things that are bad for us in the spaceship. And we say, all right, this is it. No more cement, no more beyond that level. And after that, we, do, we have a big discussion in our hands on how to re redistribute or distribute the right to use cement between competing users. And that's a discussion that we have to have as to how the, is the best way of doing it. But at the same time, we can discuss ways in which we can increase the levels of education of our children in the spaceship. So, you know, it, I, I remember the first time I taught at the University of Cambridge, I was astounded by the practice of tutorials. So one teacher, one student. That's it. A class of one student. One on one. That's very expensive. And, and it's very good. <laughs> so the rich want this kind of, of um, growth of educational services for their kids. We need that. We should have that. We should have a lot more green energy. We should have a lot more resources, human resources, being invested in education, in caring of the sick, of the weak, the of the old. We need, we need growth of human capacities and human interaction. Do the financial market. At the same time as we need physical growth to be stemmed. Do, do, do the financial system is uh, prepared to, to enter in the degrowth mode? But not in the slightest. The financial system is an amplifier of uh, all that is bad and ill in the world. This is why we need to put the financial genie in the bottle and, you know, put the cap on, uh, which is not, by the way, uh, a novel idea. Because let me remind you that in 1944, when the post-war system of finance and money was designed in the Bretton Woods Conference, Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt um, made one rule as to who was allowed in that conference and who was not allowed in that conference. There were representatives from 120 different countries and one rule. No banker was allowed in. So finance was not represented. Its financial interests were not represented in the conference that designed the 1950s and 1960s, the golden era of capitalism. So the idea that we need to put a financial genie in the bottle is not new. I've got a, a point of view about uh, Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, uh, the, the NSA, mm -hmm. and uh, the liberty on the internet who, who is threat by the, the government. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that? Well, I, I, I'm a friend of Julian Assange's, person, a personal friend of Julian Assange. Doesn't mean I agree with everything on him, but I think of him extremely highly, and I think that we are all in his debt. And I thought that even before you had ever heard of him, before he even created WikiLeaks, because I had followed his work. And I remember as a, as a young person, I was terrified when I read 1984. Like I think anybody who is 11, 12 and reads 1984 was terrified at the, at the time. Because I could see that the growth in technology made Stalin's job very easy. Well, Stalin's, Hitler's, whoever. Huh? Uh, surveillance was, was going to become exceptionally straightforward. So any system of government that had access to a capacity to turn us into fully transparent beings while it remained opaque was always going to be uh, a massive, well, it would end all hope of democracy. We don't have democracy, but that would end all hope of democracy. So that's what the, what the NSA is. The NSA can see everything we do and we have no idea what they are doing. Yeah. So when I first discovered Julian Assange's project, which was ingenious, it was to take the technology of the enemy, of Big Brother, and turn it into a gigantic mirror, and turn it onto the face of the Big Brother so we can see what the Big Brother is doing. Make sure that Big Brother cannot sleep at night, fearing 
that he is transparent to, that we can see what he is doing. That's the whole point of WikiLeaks, right? And using incredible technology, encrypt, encryption, in order to make sure that nobody can bring down something like WikiLeaks, that great mirror. This is why I was... Uh, now, Ed Snowden is a different kind of beast, person, in the sense that he's closer to my other great hero, Dan Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers, uh, because these were people who were embedded in the system, who believed in the system, and suddenly had an epiphany. Unlike Julian, Julian was always an outsider, uh, trying to break in. Um, Dan Ellsberg and uh, Ed were inside. And they were courageous enough to come outside and tell us, warn us about what's going on. So, as Democrats, we should be part of the project of reversing the current status quo. The status quo is one where we are all transparent and power is opaque. We have to reverse that. We should all be opaque and turning power into full transparency. So you agree to keep and to maintain anonymity on the internet for the common people? Of course, but beyond that, we have to have anonymity and property rights over our data. And what about uh, the the hate who sp we spread on uh, what haters? Haters and the hate we spreading uh, on the internet? Do we have to take a law against that? Do we have to educate people? Do we have to do what? I'm a libertarian when it comes to these things. You're a Marxist libertarian? Yes, I'm a Marxist libertarian, Experience. like Karl Marx was. <laughs> no, I believe that, so, seriously. If you, when, when you say that? Marx was a libertarian. That. He was the only genuine libertarian. Because somebody who loves liberty understands that capitalism destroys it. And if you, you cannot be a libertarian without wanting to go beyond capitalism. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that if you hate capitalism, you're a libertarian, you can be a Stalinist. So, uh, life is complicated. But coming to, back to, 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 to your point, um, I don't believe in prisons and thought police as a means of fighting against uh, bigotry and against racism and, and against haters. Haters will hate. What you need to do is you need to take away their incentive to hate. Uh, most people who are doing all this are doing all this because they feel disenfranchised. And I, I will go back to what I said to you in the context of the discussion of the lorry driver who voted for Trump and, and who was against Obamacare, even though his life would have been saved by it. We must engage with them. There is no substitute for open-ended dialogues. You are ready to, to dialogue with uh, Steve Bannon? Yes. I would debate Steve Bannon. I would debate anyone. I think that, um, for instance, look, when I, when, when I, when I was um, in my teens, one of the most inspiring things I read was Dimitrov's um, presentation, speech, in his trial when he was being tried by the Nazis and condemned to death. Looking at the Nazis in the eye and telling him why he has lost his way and why his position is both illogical and one that he should be ashamed of himself is our task. It's not an easy task, but there's no alternative to that. Our community asked us uh, yesterday if you received uh, uh, threats from uh, people when you, you, you've been uh, uh, the Minister of Finance uh, of Greece. What kind of threat you received? Well, not when I was minister. I received them before I was minister and after I was minister. What kind? Um, threat? To, the, to my family. Threats for the life of my family. Yes. Before, and, and the interesting one, aspect of it is that the worst came before I was minister. Um, when I was uh, involved in unearthing the practices of Greek bankers. <laughs> and after? After that, it was more vulgar. More vulgar? More vulgar, yeah. Because yes. the, it, it comes from, from uh, the European uh, banker? Or? Oh, no, no, no. 
I don't know who it came from. I, I, they were anonymous. They, they used an interesting tactic. Uh, I remember there were various, but I'll give you the, the one that from a media point of view is more interesting. Uh, so there was this uh, website that published a story uh, about how there was an intruder in my house, a burglar who came in to burgle my, my, apart my apartment, and how he was deterred by my, my security guard, which was very interesting because firstly, there was no burglar, and secondly, I don't have a security guard. <laughs> and I thought, what on earth? I mean, these people have such an excited imagination. And then the, the police called me to say that I should be, that this is something I should be worried about. And I said, ah, come on, the idiots. You know. And he said, no, 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 sir. You haven't read the small print in that report. And I read it again. And there I saw what was the reason for the police's uh, concern. The website mentioned the, my address. And lo and behold, when I went home that night, I found an envelope. And it was handwritten and said, um, it didn't happen this time, but now, body, now everybody has your address, and it will happen soon. That kind of thing. So we've, we've had exciting times. Did you, saw the, did you sue the, the, the website? No. No? No. I will never give them the satisfaction of suing them. You know, the bad people hate it when you're kind to them. Yeah, they, they hate And that. I am kind to them just because they, they get so upset. Have you, have you got uh, some advices uh, to fight against the fake news, the so-called fake news? Well, keep, keep doing the right thing. Keep, keep having discussions that are meaningful. Um, always acknowledge your own doubts. Never present your case as if it is beyond dispute or beyond doubts, um, and lead by example. There's nothing else we can do. So now we just arrived in the, the part uh, of our interview um, um, that I'm going to ask the question from internet, from our community. Okay. So the first question was, is, what do you have to say about the looks leaks? About? Looks leaks. You know the... Ah, uh, looks leaks, looks leaks, yeah. Any point of view about uh, to protect whistleblowers or stuff like that? Of course. Go we ahead. should have legislation that protects whistleblowers. We don't. All attempts to introduce, to introduce such, such legislation have been uh, annulled uh, by the deep state interests to maintain Europe as a gigantic tax haven. Uh, the way in which uh, all these lists and leaks have been annulled, and it's business as usual, is a blot on the European landscape. Next question, what do you think about the modern monetary policy? And what about new capitalism? Modern monetary theory. Yeah. MMT. And can you apply to your... Uh, I am, my answer to, to, the, to this question, because I frequently face it, is that uh, the MMT economists, especially in the United States, are all my friends. I know them all personally. We are close. I am MMT friendly, even though I do not necessarily agree with everything that they say. MMT is, and I think the second part of the question shows that our questioner understands, MMT is uh, very apt in the case of the dollar in the United States because they print the world reserve currency. So as Donald Trump has proven beyond reasonable doubt, deficits don't count in the United States. You can have as, as high, high deficits as, as you wish. Um, and, and this is not going to create a run on the dollar or anything like that. Um, the basic premise of MM MMT is correct. And that is that most of money is created by private banks, not by central banks. And there is no reason why we should assume that investment in green technologies, in the things that humanity needs, must necessarily come out of taxation. In Europe, for instance, as we speak, 
because there was a question about the euro, we have about 2 trillion euros that is sitting there idly in the financial system doing nothing but ill. So as DiEM25, as the European Spring, we are proposing an investment program that is based, and that's why I mentioned the European Investment Bank before, on a large-scale issue of EIB bonds to soak up this liquidity and to use this as the basis for funding the Green New Deal that we need in Europe. That, that is consistent with MMT. Other question, what do you think about Piketty's idea to create a new European assembly with only a few countries? It's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Uh, well, firstly, look, uh, Thomas Piketty has many good ideas and his proposals regarding the Eurozone have been shifting. I remember I, together with Jamie Galbraith, my collaborator from the United States, we wrote a response to his group's ideas in 2011-2012. That was a lot more ambitious, that plan. It, there was a, he, invo he had the idea that Macron later had of a federal budget and common unemployment insurance. But as all the Macron plans are going out of the picture, Piketty's ambition is also diminishing. So his latest idea is to have a nation-based, nation-state-based increase in corporate taxation and that money to be spent within the nation-state where the money is raised, but at the same time to have a, a Eurochamber parliament. I don't understand what is the point. If it's all nation-based, Why do you need a euro chamber? And if we're going to save the eurozone and convert it into move towards a, fed, a federation, a democratic federation, you know, wh why why have fewer countries? The moment you start getting rid of countries like Greece, Portugal, whatever, then you cannot contain the domino effects. Italy will come out. If Italy comes out, the whole thing is destroyed. So I'm not very impressed. My, my next question: uh, Are you in fear? With the Italy exit, Italy exit. Well, I'm in fear of having uh, Matteo Salvini in government, because, as I said, he is a carbon copy of Mussolini, and that is my great fear. And my, if, if, allow me to then weave my fear further into a tapestry of terror, of what terrorizes me. Well, I'll tell you what terrorizes me: that Macron loves Salvini. And Salvini loves Macron, not, not as a person. They hate each other, but they need each other. Macron and Juncker on the one hand, huh? what is their excuse for seeking your support? If it's not us, it's Salvini. So Salvini is a gift for Macron. Macron's agenda for Europe has died. It's finished. He admits it. Everything he proposed in Sorbonne is completely gone. Merkel has killed it, and so have the Social Democrats the SPD in Germany. And his, his, his own cabal in the Elysee have taken it back. So there's no European agenda now from Macron. So what is his only argument as to why people, the people of France should support him? If it's not him, it's Le Pen and Salvini. And it's probably correct as well. Yeah? It's not untrue. But he needs Salvini and, um, and, uh, and Le Pen. Otherwise, his agenda is zero. Salvini needs Macron and Juncker to be imposing austerity in order to create the anger and the discontent and the deprivation that feeds beasts like Salvini. So what I'm completely terrorized by is that we live in a Europe where the political narrative is monopolized by these accomplices, because they're accomplices. They're bouncing off one another. They're each other's best friends in reality, even not anthropologically. That must be seen as the enemy of Europe, this duet between the forces of the so-called liberal establishment, which is neither very well established, not liberal, okay, and the neo-fascists. This is what, why DiEM25 is claiming, is saying, is pronouncing that these two are a common front for us. We are Europeanists who believe that in order to save Europe and in order to integrate our peoples, in one pan-European democratic federation, we must fight equally the Macrons and the Junkers on the one hand and the Salvinis and the Le Pens on the other. That's why you made some uh, agreement or some, some talk with Benoit Hamon. Do you know who is Benoit Hamon? Uh, he's a good friend of mine. 
He's a good friend. And also we are running together. He's part of DM's European Spring. You need to teach him uh, what is uh, waterboarding. Because uh, okay. he forgot. Look, let he me, forgot let me tell you how, how we operate uh, as, as DM across Europe. About a year ago, we concluded after two years of work our agenda for Europe. We call it the European New Deal, the European Green New Deal. And th th we struggled for this. We, we, we really worked very hard to answer the question, what needs to be done across Europe? With Benoit No, no, that's <laughs> DiEM25. Regarding public debt, banks, private debt, green investments, deprivation, poverty, and so on. And we came up with a long and, I believe, technically and politically very useful document, policy agenda. And then what we said was, uh, and we said that in Napoli, in Italy, we had a press conference and we invited European movements from every country just on the basis of self-selection. Come and talk to us about this agenda. We think this agenda should be put to the European voters in the May 2019 European Parliament election across Europe, from Sweden to Portugal, from Ireland to Greece. For the first time, we need one European agenda for the whole of Europe. That has never happened before. So different movements and different politicians and different parties came to the party, came to us to discuss this. Benoit Hamon and our comrades from Generation were one of them. They self-selected, so they came together with good people from Poland, the Brazen Party, the Alternative Party in Denmark, the Green Party, effectively, of Denmark came along, Actua from, from Spain, Livre from Portugal. Uh, we created our own party in Germany called Democratie in Europa. Uh, and we, the, all that we call the European Spring. For a year now, since then, we've been meeting every month to develop our agenda, the Green New Deal for Europe, and Benoit Mon, Isabel Thomas, Guillaume Ballas, these are European members of Parliament of Generation, are part of this process. We exclude no one who wants to work with us on the basis of what needs to be done. We want to move away from the politics of the past, where you know, a group of friends go together and say, oh, let's run together. And then after we go together, we scratch our heads to, an to answer the question, so what do we propose? What is the agenda that we put to, to voters? We want to do it the other way around. Let's agree on the agenda. Let's agree on what needs to be done with green investment, for instance. Where does the money come from? Precisely. What do we do on Monday morning? This is what the left has always lacked. Precise programs that can excite the imagination of people, not just the usual suspects. And anyone who comes to the table to discuss this with us is our comrade. So Benoit Amon is one of them. Good luck. Uh, other question from internet. You want to change Europe from inside, but the European Parliament is only consultative. So even you get political power, you can't reform it. So that is absolutely correct. The European Union Parliament, the European Parliament is more or less useless. Uh, we're not saying elect us into the European Parliament because we'll change Europe from within the European Parliament. We will try to do it, to use the European Parliament uh, as a forum to do it. Do you know what excites us about May 2019? Not so much the prospect of being in the European Parliament, that excites us too, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is that in May, you we are, piss them off a lot. Well, that too. But no, the main reason why we're excited is because the May elections happen all over Europe for one body, the European Parliament, and we have the opportunity to do that which is really at the top of our list of priorities. To be here in France, in Poland, in Denmark, in Greece, in Portugal, in Italy, at the same time, campaigning for the same agenda. So it's the process that matters in Kavafian terms, um, in Homeric terms, it's the journey more than the destination that matters for us. Because what we need to do is we need to give hope to people out there in Lyon, okay, in Marseille, in Patras, in Leipzig, that we, that we, we want to move beyond you know, the, the usual left-wing slogan, another Europe is possible. We want to show that another Europe is here. And we are it. We are the movement that has worked together for three years to come up with answers to practical problems besetting people everywhere. 
Other question from internet. What about cryptocurrency? You believe in it uh, to stabilize the system? You don't believe in cryptocurrency? No, I don't believe in cryptocurrencies, but I do believe in the algorithms uh, using, used in building up cryptocurrencies. So when Bitcoin first came up, because I have this kind of past of you know, mathematical training and computing training, uh, I studied the blockchain algorithm and I was fascinated by it. And I remember back in, it was 2011, I wrote an article saying this is a fantastic solution to a problem that we have not discovered yet. Uh, but it's not an answer to the question of what currency we want. But I have to say that, even back then, 2012, 2013, I started designing a parallel payment system, which then I tried to implement when I was in the government. And uh, I'm being demonized for that. I'm be even being called the national traitor for having put forward this proposal and, and tried to implement it. Um, because I, be I believe that in the Eurozone, our member states should have public payment systems that bypass the banking system. And that would create, based on our tax systems. Bypass SWIFT or bypass the banking system? All of it. All of them? All of it. That is, uh, the, the design is based on the tax office website. So here in France, you have uh, a tax file number. You go into a website and you transfer money from your private bank account to your tax file number when you have to pay taxes. And if you don't do it, your accountant does it. But th there's a system there. What I think we need to do, and I felt that a long time ago, is create a reserve account for every tax file number so that you, there are two ways in which money can go in there. One is if the state owes you money, they can put it in there. Or you can transfer money from your private bank account and put it there. Why would you do it if the state gives you a discount for paying your taxes from that account? And then with a PIN number, you can pay your friend or supplier or employee uh, from ac across these reserve accounts on the tax file system. So you, and then that can extend. You can have, you can have apps on your phone that allow you to do that. Suddenly, there is a, pa a payment system that citizens can use, taxpayers can use, that is outside international globalized fi financial systems. So the government can create uh, units there that can be used to repay euros that can be used to repay taxes, but that money cannot escape France, even though it's in euros. And I was planning to have, and you see the connection with cryptocurrencies, that this system should be based on a blockchain technology because it guarantees anonymity and decentralization. So full transparency. Huh? All citizens will know how much money there is in this model, in this system. The government cannot create too much of it because everybody will be, it's panopticon. Everybody can see through this. So I do believe in blockchain algorithms, in the algorithms and technology behind cryptocurrencies, but I think that the idea of having a currency that is outside the democratic process is a dangerous illusion. Other question, what do you think about universal income, basic income? The M25 is in favor of a universal, a universal basic dividend, not income. What is the difference with a basic income? Tell me more. The universal basic income idea is meant to be financed from taxation. We're against that. And we're against that for political reasons, uh, as well as economic reasons. The political reason is this. Take a hard-working proletarian, uh, who goes to the building site, works all day, comes home and suddenly he, he or she hears on the news that uh, we're going to introduce a UBI and his taxes or her taxes are going to be used to pay somebody sitting on the couch watching television every, every day, whether this person is rich or poor, universal. This is divisive. This person is not going to like it. Then you cannot drum up support amongst the working class for this. But let's look at our proposal, the UBD as opposed to UBI, Universal Basic Dividend, not income. Our corporations are increasingly making money in return to capital that they have not produced. Either capital that has been produced by the state, like for instance, we all know that if you take any smartphone and you open it up, all of the technologies in there were developed on the basis of some government grant. But the government, the state and society that finance them don't get a penny out of the sale of an iPhone. Point number one. Point number two. 
when uh, you use Google Maps, or, well, you, most people do, uh, when you, 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 you search on a, on, on, a, on a search engine, something, huh? the, your friend or your enemy, immediately you are contributing to the capital of that company. When you put a post on Facebook, on a blog, on WordPress, you are contributing to the capital of that corporation. But you are getting none of the benefits. You are not getting a return on capital that you created. Okay? So increasingly, capital is produced socially and profits are privatized. So what we... And, and this is now the conclusion. The deimposition is any corporation with more than 300 employees uh, to have a license to function in Europe must issue shares amounting to 10% of its capital and put it into a European equity fund. And those, the dividends that accumulate in that European equity fund then distribute, are distributed to everyone on the basis that we, society, in a way that it's impossible to discriminate between you and I, are producing those returns, those profits. Uh, a few questions. Who, who wrote the BEPG, -E GOP? Gopé. I don't know what it is. I B E P G. Yeah. B P G. B P B E P G. B E P G or G O P E, and we have no idea what it is. I have no idea. The rule that the European Community can uh, we refuse them, or we will see about that. Uh, what is your opinion about the same-sex marriage? <sighs> I'm ambivalent. Let me tell you why. I'm an old lefty. We grew up against marriage. You know, we were supposed to, you know, the May 68 uh, generation, we were again, we were in free love, you know, no social contracts between people that want to have sex or have to have uh, loving relationships. Have you ever uh, smoked a joint? Yeah, of course. What do you think I am, in a complete idiot? Of course I've smoked a joint. And I still do occasionally. <laughs> And I inhale. <laughs> Even though I'm not very good at it, because whenever I smoke, I go to sleep very soon after that. But that's another matter. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not great fun for my friends. Um, so, to cut a long story short, um, when I hear um, gay people um, go crazy about the, the right to marry, I think, but we, we should do away with marriage altogether for heterosexuals as well. But then, of course, in the end, I agree with them. Because uh, it's a question of equality. And it is a question of human rights, uh, in the sense that you know I had a friend who died of AIDS, and the person that was completely distraught and who was next to him all his life was prevented by the family of the dead man from being in the funeral on the basis that he had no rights. That must end here and now. The first part of my answer is an instinctive May 68 one in the here and now. We should all have the right to marry anyone we want. Um, and then together, let's think of a society where we don't need contracts. And what about the, uh, the, the country? The, sorry for that. Uh, procreation. Artificial procreation. No, not artificial procreation. Uh, 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 the, um, well, we will see about uh, the next question. Is this um, having a, a, a child? Yeah. Surrogacy. Surrogacy, no. that's it. Oh, I, I can't stand surrogacy. The idea that a woman um, hires out her womb in the context of our enterprise culture disgusts me. I, have, I don't know what this would mean in terms of policy. I, don't, I haven't thought it through. But I have to say that, um, look, we live in a world where there are so many orphans out there. There are so many kids that, you know, are dying for some love, affection, and parenting. That using your monetary power to rent out the womb of a woman who is then used as a vessel, instead of taking an orphan, doesn't agree with me. This is my gut feeling. I don't have a policy on it. We arrived uh, at the end of uh, our interview. The la there is two uh, questions. Okay. The first one is, 
uh, give you some uh, give give to us some book some advice to choose books what is your favorite books and what uh, oh my goodness three. that is an impossible question yeah give, give us three yeah and the next you'll ask me for my favorite three pieces of music and then the three yeah, no, three no, movies no, i'll books. die i mean i have no idea uh three okay for that, you the most powerful book that you ever read the most uh, powerful the most uh, powerful Enlightening, exactly. I'm I will give you three, but they will be completely at random. If you ask me five minutes later, I'll give you another, another three. Go ahead. So let, let me be o open about this. Um, I think that, um, okay, three, right? One is, um, I think it must be Sophocles plays, especially the uh, the, the trilogy um, around Oedipus, Antigone, and so on. Uh, that, that, that's crucial to me in terms of my understanding of resistance to authority and also to the power of prophecy, which is so important in fashioning the world we live in. Um, a second book which I think is um, um, essential to my upbringing is um, the preface to the introduction to the critique of political economy by Karl Marx. Okay, that particular little you know, ten pager, it's a remarkable impact on on my life. Uh, and let's add Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky for a bit of bleakness and darkness. So the last question is not a question, is uh, give an advice to the young generation, something like a bottle in the sea. Something like? A bottle in the sea, uh, a, in message, the sea. a message in the bottle. Subvert the dominant paradigm. That's, that's it? That's it. Never take anything that is presented to you as authoritative, as authoritative. Subvert it. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you. Thank you. Cut.